साथ ही देखो फेसबुक पे भी आ गए हैं मेरे ख्याल में आ गए Okay, now we are all set. So, am I audible to everyone? Yes, it's okay for me. Yes, sir. We had a registration of 23, 14 have come. So I think we can safely start. People will join in. So it's already three minutes up as per our schedule time. So I will start. Let me just enter. My professor has also come, Professor Zayauddin. And I'll just also introduce him to Dr. Ma Martin so that... Uh, he was our professor when we were studying in UET Lahore. So let me see whether he, yeah, he's here. And uh, just. Yeah, Dr. Martin, you can, you must be seeing uh, Professor Ziauddin. He has just uh, uh, logged in. He was our professor in uh, University of Technology in Lahore, University of Engineering and Technology, Lahore. I, Sohail, here you can see Rizwan and Dr. Riyaz Akhtar. We are all his students. So it's again an honor that we have our professor and you also here. So we will now start, inshallah, formally. Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of Allah, the most gracious and the most merciful. Ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum, good morning and good afternoon. From Pakistan Society of Civil Engineers, based in Lahore, Pakistan. A very warm welcome to all the participants who have joined us on Facebook. This lecture number 49, organized under the auspices of Pakistan Society of Civil Engineers. These lectures which we hold every month is continuation of series of lectures that PSCE is presenting since 2020. For the benefit of young and experienced engineers, and our endeavor is to keep our fraternity abreast with advancing knowledge in different disciplines of civil engineering. Now, before I introduce the topic of today and the guest speaker, it is my duty and my responsibility to spell out the rules of webinar as per Pakistan Engineering Council's instructions. As you all know, first rule is that all registered participants for CVD points have to appear live on webcam. However, for the ladies, there is an exception. If they wish, they can cover their face while appearing live on webcam. Second, during the lecture, microphone of all the participants except that of speaker shall remain in mute position. Third, there will be a Q&A session of 20 minutes at the end of the lecture where you will have the privilege of asking your questions using your microphone. However, those who do not wish to use their microphone can type the questions in the chat box, which I will read out for the guest speaker to answer. Participants on Facebook have only one option. They will have to type their questions in the chat box. Ladies and gentlemen, now the topic. You must be aware that today's topic is effects of magnitude 7.5 Mangil earthquake of June 21, 1990 on the 106-meter-high Safed Rad Patras Dam in Iran. Ladies and gentlemen, 
It is my privilege and honor to present to you Dr. Martin Wieland as our guest speaker of today. And I'll just give you a brief introduction of his because we are normally and usually hard pressed with the time. Dr. Martin Wieland has been the chairman of ICO Committee on Seismic Effects of DAB Design since 1999. For those who are not aware of ICOLD, it's International Commission on Large Dams. As a senior dam and earthquake expert, he was involved in seismic safety evaluation of some of the world's largest arch dams, such as the 250 meter high Mauvizen Arch Dam in Switzerland, the 249 meter high Deriner Arch Dam in Turkey, and the 203 meter days, days arch dam in Iran. And there are a few others also. Dr. Wayland was a member of the Structural Advisory Board of New Ship Locks of the Panama Canal Authority, which was completed in 2016. Dr. Wayland was the chairman of the International Panel of Experts for the Neelam Jalam hydropower project in Kashmir, Pakistan. He was also a member of the panel of experts for large storage dams in Colombia, Ethiopia, Indonesia, Iran, Latvia, Papua New Guinea, and Sudan. During the last 40 years, Dr. Wayland worked on large dam and, and major infrastructure projects in 35 countries and was involved in over 115 large dam projects. From 1980 to 1990, he was a faculty member in the Division of Structural Engineering and Construction of Asian Institute of Technology in Bangkok, Thailand, where he offered courses on earthquake engineering, structural dynamics, and other structural engineering subjects. Since 1990, he has been working with AFRY Switzerland, which is a European leader in engineering design and advisory services. Dr. Weyland received an honorary professorship from Hohai University in Nanjing, China in 2002, and is an honorary member of ICOLD. He has authored more than 300 technical papers in fields of dam and earthquake engineering. Dr. Rayland obtained his MSc and PhD degrees in civil engineering from Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Zurich, Switzerland in 1971 and 1978, respectively. His PhD thesis was related to earthquake behavior of gravity dams, hydrodynamic interaction effects, and non-uniform ground motion. So this was a very brief uh, introduction of Dr. Wayland. So, Doctor, the lecture, the floor is yours. Con kindly continue with your lecture. <clears throat> okay, uh, Mr. Dyer, uh, thank you very much for your very kind introduction. I'm trying to upload now. Yeah, the screen is okay. Share screen is okay. Please go ahead. Yes. Okay. So the title was already announced, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to talk here to engineers in Pakistan. As it was mentioned at the beginning, uh, can you hear me? Yes, you are audible. Okay. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, I have been in Pakistan for, uh, let me say, almost 10 years, uh, working on the Nilum Chilum project. And uh, it was always uh, very interesting for me also to work in uh, Pakistan. Actually, we liked to work in um, Pakistan uh, in connection with this project. Now, just to say, uh, I, I'm graduated, I graduated from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, uh, just uh, as an introduction here. The most famous graduate from uh, uh, 
the ETH, as it is called, is uh, Mr. Einstein, Albert Einstein. Okay, the, I would say the most famous uh, scientist. Okay, but uh, he's not in engineering. So uh, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology is also the number one university in Central Europe. Only better universities are only in the US and in England. Okay, uh, let me say a few words also about the International Commission on Large Dams. I called, you may know, uh, Pakistan is a member of I called already for a very long time. It, uh, there are 103 countries who are members of I called, and uh, there are about, uh, let me say, 20,000 dam experts. Uh, who are members of the national committees, which are members of ICOLD. And I would like to say just uh, a few words about the seismic committee. It is called Committee on Seismic Aspects of Dam Design. It was uh, established in 1968, about 54 years ago. As you can see, ICOLD is already 90 years old, it's 94 years old, it's from 19. 28. Now, what are Dr. these things? Dr. Whelan, Dr. Whelan uh, I hope you are not showing anything on the screen because it is black. It is black. How is it possible? Can you see here? No, it is black. First slide came, we could see it, but when you changed, it is blank now. We, the screen is there. You are sharing the screen, but nothing we can see. I don't know what is a no. Okay, I just try here to relaunch. Yeah, now, now it is okay. Now it is okay. Can you see it? Yeah, I, we saw it. Then it has again disappeared. It. Uh, strange. I'm sharing, so it's uh, it's a little strange, but but I cannot. Probably it doesn't work when I use. Okay, let me try once more here with. Uh, Do you see it? Is, is the screen visible? Hello? Dr. Wieland, when you, when you make it a slideshow, the screen is no more, uh, not visible anymore. But it, now, now it is it, visible. Now it, it is visible. visible. Now it okay. is visible. If if I made the full screen, it somehow it disappeared. Yeah, that's right. Oh, okay. So you, so I you, will, can, you can go ahead with this. Big, big, I, this is, yes, this is I, I, will go, I will go ahead with this screen. Yeah, right. It's Thank better. you. Okay. So, so sorry, I, I don't know what is the problem with the full screen, but I will go with that. Okay, this was the first slide. The second slide was, I just mentioned the most famous graduate from uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Mr. Einstein. Okay, and I graduated from that university. And I just want to say a few words now about the International Commission on Large Dams and uh, the work the Committee on Seismic Aspects of Dam Design has been doing. Okay. Basically, uh, the main work which uh, these technical committees, there are about 25 uh, are the development of uh, technical bulletins. And uh, we have uh, published a number of bulletins. You could also say they are guidelines. Guidelines, design guidelines. There are guidelines on seismic hazard. I just uh, listed them here. I don't go through all of them. It is uh, dams on fault, 
for example, Carbela Dam is on uh, on fault. So that is the uh, visibility in addressing this kind of issues. Then we have problems with reservoirs and seismicity. Okay, cases are not known to me from Pakistan, but there are uh, in other parts of the world, we have what we call reservoir triggered seismicity. So these are two bulletins dealing with this seismic hazard. We have one bulletin, which is, I would say, very important for the design of large dams, uh, which is entitled Selecting Seismic Parameters for Large Dams, which gives basic, basically the seismic design criteria, which are the basis of any analysis. Then there is the bulletin 52, which is already quite old. It deals with the dynamic analysis of dams, and it was authored by famous people like Kienkiewicz, Klopp, and Steve. And you know, Mr. Klopp, he was the inventor of the finite element method. So there were famous people uh, uh, working in this uh, committee. There is, are other uh, bulletins dealing with some design aspects, okay, because it is quite important that you do, that you start with a project with a proper concept, and if you follow the conceptual guidelines, you will arrive at the dam which uh, will behave most likely favorable during an earthquake. And the last type we have is related to inspection. It is called inspection of dams following earthquakes. So that, that is the kind of guidelines we have uh, prepared at this time. We have uh, different types of different uh, guidelines on the preparation on numerical analysis, dynamic analysis of embankment dams. Uh, we have uh, other ones on observational data of strong ground motions at dam sites. These are mainly data we have obtained from Japan where some statistical analysis is being done, and we are also dealing on some bulletin on um, uh, electromechanical and hydromechanical equipment. Okay, so let me uh, continue. Yeah, it's a little too fast. This is just the, the beginning, and I would say an important aspect I would like to address here, and I would like to mention is that. Uh, you should not forget for large dam projects, the seismic hazard is a multi hazard. Uh, okay, most if you are structural engineer, uh, you are mainly dealing with the effect of ground shaking, and the, your structures have to be designed only for ground shaking. And this is also, I would say, the fact that most earthquake regulations are concerned with this hazard only ground shaking is a typical one. But for large dams, we have other aspects. We have fault movement in a dam foundation. I mentioned already Tarbela Dam, or in Iran, we have some cases where we have discontinuities in dam foundation, which are practical setting planes and so on, uh, which may move during nearby strong earthquakes. It is possible that you have movement there. We have both movement in a reservoir, which may cause water waste in a reservoir or loss of freeboard. Very important, which we have seen from the eventual earthquake in 2008, are mass movements, rock falls. I think more than 100,000 mass movements have occurred, but you know this experience already from the Musafarabad earthquake of 2005, where you have experienced a lot of uh, uh, mass movement. Of course, they cause damage to hydraulic structures, to gates, buildings, and so on. And it is quite important that uh, such mass movement into the reservoir could create impulse waves in the reservoir, which may lead to overtopping of the dam. And there are some other 
site specific or project specific hazards which are related to only specific to concrete dams or embankment dams, asphalt core dams, and so on, concrete based rock fill dams. So these are project specific hazards. And I would like to come now to the subject here. I would like to talk about this uh, Munchin earthquake. You see here the map of Iran. Let me see here. Pakistan, Baluchistan. I, I must say I've been in Iran for about 30 years and I have traveled there maybe 40, 50 times, but I never came basically here to the eastern part of Iran. So this uh, Manchil earthquake, this is the Caspian Sea, is very close to the Caspian Sea. As you can see here, this is in an enlargement. It's the Caspian Sea and the root bar Loresta, uh, so, sorry, the Sefid Root Dam is in the Albors mountain range and uh, it is located here. It is about 60 kilometers from the town of Rush. Okay. Now, uh, if we look into the tectonics a little bit. Here is the dam site. This is, you can see a little bit, there are two rivers coming, one from here from the left and one from the right, and form this reservoir here. And the dam is basically located yeah, at the location of a fault. The fault is very close. And this earthquake is called Manjil earthquake because it, uh, the town of Manjil is just a few kilometers away from a dam site, as you can see, very five kilometers or even less. And I'm referring to another place, Abar. Abar is a site where some strong motion instruments were installed. Otherwise, there are no records available on this earthquake near the dam, but the closest station is it of our station. So therefore, I'm uh, just showing it here. So let me come here. I, I must say I was, my first visit to Iran was actually in connection with this uh, Sefidruk Dam. There was, uh, let me say, an international panel was established basically by then President uh, Rafsan Chani to look into the uh, uh, seismic safety of this uh, safety route dam, which I want to show because this dam project is the most important one probably in Iran for the irrigation of large parts of land where most of the rice is grown in um, Iran. So this was on the way, these are photos I have taken, I must say, this was on the way to the dam site Okay, we see here a lot of uh, debris on all sides. We see here, so in the forest, there were some buildings, but you don't see anymore. All were basically destroyed 100%. And on the way, we have seen here, I would say this is now close to this Manjil. The buildings were all, all, I would say practically all destroyed, collapsed buildings everywhere. But the Iranians, I must say, they were extremely efficient with this rescue operation because they were already used to, uh, let me say, some uh, disasters from the Iraq-Iran war from the 1980s to 1988. So let me... Uh, uh, say a few words about this uh, dam. It's a buttress dam. Here, this is a type of dam. I would say today we would not build them, okay, because they are too labor intensive, but let me say in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, until then, many of these dams were built because you could save quite some um, concrete. Now, just uh, I will show us a few pictures later. I would just like to refer to some 
of the, let me say, elements of this project for dam construction. Two so-called diversion tunnels were built, as you can see here, the red one, two, which were then converted into spillways. You see here, the intake here is called the Morning Glory Spillway, and the other intake is here. So this is for the spillway. Then there is another spillway, which is called the uh, Orifice Spillway, or the Intermediate Level Spillway, which is here on the left bank. The reservoir is on this side. And we have here uh, a number of outlets. Uh, you cannot read it well, number seven, are so-called irrigation outlets. As I said, it is used for irrigation of that area downstream. And irrigation outlets, you can also call it low-level outlets. Under They would go under the term low-level outlets. And here is the intake. These are the intakes uh, for, the, for the power plant. We have a small power plant here right at the downstream foot of the dam. So these are the main elements. And of course, this here is a, is a dam built of these uh, different buttresses. So if we look into some buttresses, I uh, don't want to go into the detail, but this is a crest area. What you can see, well, that is what I marked in the red. We have here, Okay, the crest is a vertical, but here we have a kink, which is the head of the buttress, and this is a web of the buttress. And we have here also, as you can see, a kink. And we know from structural analysis, if we have a kink along, uh, let me say, a, a plate, this is a point of stress concentration. And at the location of stress concentration, if you would follow actually theory of elasticity, you would get infinite stresses. So these are basically locations of these kinks, inside kinks, are points of structural weakness in terms of this stress concentration at these locations. Here is a plan also showing a typical one. This is the head of a buttress, and here we have the web of the buttress, and in between it is empty. Therefore, I said uh, by this buttress dams, you can save concrete. If you would have a gravity dam, this would also be filled with concrete. In Switzerland, these dams will not be allowed because of military reasons. Because of military reasons, uh, uh, we need uh, stronger dams. So we have one of these dams, and in a second or after the Second World War, uh, let me say these opening spaces have to be filled by uh, concrete. Okay, this is a view of this uh, dam, and it also shows uh, there is some instrumentation provided in these dams, and uh, we can see. We have uh, basically uh, pendulums which are installed in different of the, in different buttresses and uh, to monitor the deformational behavior of the dam. It depends a lot on these uh, uh, pendulums. Okay, so this is a typical instrumentation. Instrumentation, of course, we have also seepage uplift. Uh, uh, monitoring devices in dams. So um, now let this is just a, we we came to this uh, uh, let me say dam just a few days after the earthquake, and then we arrived there. You see here there are these irrigation outlets. They were in operation. They were in operation actually to lower the reservoir. You know, if the dam is damaged or unsafe, in order to increase the safety of the dam, the best mean is, or the simplest mean is, to lower the reservoir. It sounds quite trivial, 
but the most efficient way, and I think the only way, how you can increase you, the safety of your dam is by lowering the reservoir. Therefore, it is essential to have this low level outlet. There are many dams, I must say, in the world which do not have this uh, low level outlet, and then it is not possible to lower, uh, to lower the reservoir. I think I forgot to mention that this uh, uh, Manchil earthquake, it has caused about, uh, there are different reports, it has caused uh, about 40,000 people who were killed during that earthquake, and most of them very close to the dam site. So it was basically the strongest or the most destructive earthquake in the last uh, uh, 10 years of the uh, 20th uh, century. Of course, uh, you, the earthquake, the Musafarabad earthquake, uh, was more severe in terms of casualties than this earthquake here. I would also like to say that in a previous slide, I have shown some uh, faults and some faults probably pass just here a few about less than one kilometer from the location of the dam so this magnitude 7.4 earthquake this epicenter the epicenter was basically here it caused very severe ground shaking to the dam and up to now and therefore this is also the reason why i'm why i have selected this project is because I was there and uh, up to now it is still the concrete dam which has experienced the strongest ground shaking of any concrete dam in the world. So therefore by let me say observing the damages at this dam we may be able to make conclusions on the possible behavior of dams which will be subjected to the strongest ground shaking. As you may know, in a dam industry for large dams, uh, we request that the dams must be able to withstand the strongest effect of earthquakes. And that would be, for example, wherever you are, we have here this magnitude 7.5 earthquake just a few hundred meters away from this, this dam. So therefore the lessons learned from the behavior of this dam are still, also it is already 30 years ago, are still, I must say, extremely relevant for people working in the field of um, earthquake safety, earthquake safety of dams. So please keep in mind, it is very important that you can lower the reservoir after a strong earthquake, and that here is being done by so-called uh, irrigation outlets. In Switzerland, we call them bottom outlets, but they are and they are used basically in Switzerland. The reason was also due to uh, military reasons; they have been uh, required. So we see here these different buttresses. You may see here some water seeping out. This is just after the earthquake. And we see here the powerhouse, the small powerhouse. This is a, a, a view from upstream of the dam. Okay, and uh, here the reservoir was already lowered a few meters. Of course, we did not lower the whole reservoir because people, uh, let me say for irrigation purposes, they needed the water. So the authorities were not allowing to lower the reservoir too much. It was just sufficient that uh, it was lowered below the damage which had observed at this uh, dam. Again, another view from uh, from the dam here with the powerhouse. And here on the left bank, you can see what I mentioned before. This is the intermediate level spillway. There are two types of spillways. I'll just show it. And you see here close up from the opening of this uh, irrigation outlet. The, this is just after the earthquake. I would also like to say after the earthquake, 
basically the site was deserted. It's also a problem because from, I think, from the seven people who were in charge of uh, dam safety of the project, six actually died in a village close by to the dam site. So the dam was, after the earthquake, was basically deserted. Now, what has occurred to the dam? This shows some arrows, you may see it. I don't know if you see it, but I, on my screen, I can see it quite well. We have some seed pitch here developing and we have some seed pitch developing here. That means there have been cracks through the dam, basically from upstream to downstream, both locations. And then along this crack, water was seeping through this crack, but since the water level was about here, the water pressure was quite small, so the water did not uh, appear, let me say, under high pressure, so it was just seeping slowly, as we can see here. Therefore, for lowering of a reservoir, it was necessary to lower below these uh, uh, places where we have the effluent We see here a clock spy. There is water coming out along these cracks, and these cracks were basic, basically the lift elevations, the lift joints, because the dam is constructed in lifts of typically at that time of two meters. So this is one lift, and then the next lift and they were probably not cleaned properly. So therefore, these are the weak points and cracks developed along these uh, so-called lift joints. Okay, we see here some uh, from another view. There are seed pitches occurring along here, along here, along here, along here at several buttresses. And this seepage, it is a clear indication that uh, the cracks propagate from upstream to downstream. They were at a depth of 10 meters or more. So it is not like that, that these seismic cracks just occur uh, at the depth of one or two meters. Once the crack develops in these concrete dams, they are unreinforced, of course, they propagate actually through the whole dam. So don't think of uh, uh, crack depths of one or two meters in earthquakes. So there was one buttress which had a critical crack, uh, and it was at the kink, as we can see here. We had a crack here, we had a crack here, some more cracks here, and this basically led, this is about I think three, six meters high. This caused that this wedge, here this triangle wedge, became unstable, was detached, and it was moved during the earthquake. There were some other cracks, shrinkage cracks from the construction, which are not relevant, but it is these cracks which are the critical cracks which I'm showing at this location. And again, these cracks develop at this kink, this is a critical kink. Okay, this is a close by how it uh, happened. We have this, because this is, if we look into the safety of the dam, the stability of the dam, we have to look into some phenomena as shown here. We had a crack between, this is the head of the buttress, and this is a wedge. So we have at this interface is again, uh, uh, let me say a construction joint, and we have here a lift joint where we have a crack which propagates through the whole dam, and we have here in between a kind of uh, inclined shear crack. So therefore, by this cracking system, this wedge here was it was four meters. Sorry, uh, it's a, just two lifts high, high, so it detached. So therefore, during the ground shaking, it moved, as you can see here. Okay, it moved about 25 uh, millimeters. And you can see here, again, at the location of this kink, 
you have yeah you have this stress concentration and you can see here the, the cracking occurs at the location of this crack of this uh, stress concentration so change in the stiffness of the dam are critical points and uh, you can maybe you're able to see this is a wedge this wedge which was separated which i've shown in the slide before uh, it moved actually about this 25 yeah you can see it it moved uh, about 25 30 millimeters and it is clear if the ground shaking would have lasted much longer uh, this movement would have increased usually the inelastic behavior of the dams uh, let me say depend directly on the duration of strong ground shaking so we see here yeah here we see some more crack here not all were directly at this interface in some other blocks we see here some crack it yeah we can only see it very weakly we have some other cracks developing at this uh, location at the this is all only downstream phase now at the upstream phase you can see here we have basically cracked through all blocks the crack propagated here and uh, the cracks again as i mentioned they are along this lift elevation the dam is built at in blocks of a height of two meters this is also the reservoir which uh, which is a few days which is about 10 days later we spend about five days at the dam site so this is already the lowered reservoir but when the earthquake occurred most likely the reservoir level was about here so therefore if you have cracks developing here the water pressure in this crack was small was one meter head so the, the water did not uh, let me say came as a jet through these uh, small cracks okay these are is the surface of a crack of course the crack is not that wide you only have some spalling of concrete at the surface of cracks so they look quite massive this is again at the downstream phase we see the crack is basically only a few millimeters but at the surface when it moves back and forth uh, we have uh, spalling off of concrete so the cracks look much more dramatic than uh, they are really inside the dam okay this is uh, this is a well-known uh, uh, feature we have some uh, others at uh, some gates again at the upstream phase we have a cracks propagating along with lift elevation i would like to say these dams because they are built in these two meters increments they are not uh, homogeneous completely as people assume usually in the analysis if we come in the inelastic behavior the um, failure or let me say the damage or the cracks develop at the weak points and the weak points in all dams are the joints are, are the lift elevation in concrete dams so please keep that in mind now on the dam crest this is now along the dam crest we have even uh, longitudinal cracks and we see this is also along the dam crest we have even here shearing off this is a joint between uh, two blocks and this shows that uh, you have high compressive stresses in direction in this direction in direction of the dam axis usually if people doing the dam analysis they look only into the upstream downstream direction as the main um, uh, let me say as a critical uh, uh, component of the earthquake but in this case uh, we also have to look into the cross canyon component along the diamond this shows this uh, 
falling off at this uh, track. Okay, we have here some more of this uh, crack at the surface. We have here relocations of so-called joint meters. With the joint meters, you can measure the relative displacement of adjacent blocks. So they were quite uh, useful to understand the behavior, the deformational behavior of the dam after the earthquake. Okay, we see here some more in uh, in a cross canyon direction with shearing off, just showing you have large stresses in the direction of the um, dam axis. In, in, in these dams, you have also a number of control galleries. I have just put together some slides. Uh, there are some minimum displacements between edges and blocks, and uh, these. Uh, cause then maybe movements in a range of only millimeters or, or even less, but it caused a small movement. It caused then the, um, let me say, uh, uh, falling down of some uh, rock debris here, like at the surface of cracks. And we could see in a control gallery uh, that these, uh, this kind of feature shows that these joints have moved during that earthquake. Also, at the end, the movements were very small. This is the, uh, let me say, the, the left abutment. There is a platform. It seems there is some fill location. So therefore, during the shaking, we had some deformations at the dam crest at the left abutment. On the dam itself, we have an access here by tunnel. Uh, you, you can see there is this parapet wall, and the, the ground shaking, of course, is amplified at the dam crest. It, it, usually, for this type of dam, you assume that the ground motion, or let me say the peak acceleration here, is about four, five, or six times larger than the peak acceleration at the base of the dam. And this parapet wall, you see. It's uh, partly the reinforcement fractured and it was threatening to falling down. Okay, so therefore, just after the earthquake, people pushed it back to stabilize because below is the uh, powerhouse. And if there would be aftershocks, because the damage is already quite severe, uh, these elements could have fallen down on the powerhouse calling for a uh, cause of further damage. Okay, this shows here some detail of this parapet wall. Some of the reinforcements here are fractured. So it was basically only, it was actually very unstable. You have parapet walls also in the upstream phase. Here it even overturned completely. It was left there because there is here in this location, if it falls in the water, the consequences would be much lesser. Okay, we have also in the upstream phase, we have some cracks here showing some relative movements which have occurred at this joint. Now there were also joints in a at the in a control gallery, so-called foundation gallery, uh, at the base of the dam, and of course of the, at the base of the dam you have a high water pressure. You have a head of about 80, 90 meters. So therefore, there was already an old fissure which occurred during construction due to the geology, there are different uh, basalt and I think uh, uh, other uh, uh, material here. So there was a joint which caused already a fissure. And during this earthquake, it moved relatively to each other just for a few millimeters, but then the water, as you can see here, under high pressure, it is not just seeping through, it is splashing through, so they are providing some protection here for uh, people walking through. Now, let me say a few words about the spillway, because this is a, it's an important issue. You see here, we have this whole intakes of the chlorine Morning glory, spill, morning glory spillway. 
Okay, there are two of them. And you can see here, there are some rock walls. During this earthquake, I would say maybe 10,000 rock walls occurred in this epicentral region of this earthquake. You see here, there's some debris on a platform above. Here it is open here below. It's a vertical shaft here, but here is a platform. So there are some rock falls falling on this platform, also on, the, on, the, on this platform and on some other parts here. I will just show it later. You, this is now from above. You can see this is this morning glory spillway with its vertical shaft of about 80 meters. Yeah, or 100 meters, sorry. And we have here some rock falls, just small rock slides, which are caught above in, in the, uh, let me say, in the area provided above this intake. This is a very good uh, uh, solution. In addition, okay, if we look downstream, we have here, uh, let me say, the buildings of a power plant. And above there are, uh, let me say, houses or villages of people working at the dam site. And on this side, we can also see the so-called intermediate level spillway, which I would like to mention here now. This is this intermediate level spillway. When we were there, it was uh, uh, some water coming out. That means there was some leakage. There was also some debris here, some material from small slides, which fell into this uh, a uh, shoot of this uh, intermediate level spillway. But uh, I, I mentioned in the previous one, we had this uh, leakage and the leakage was due to the gate, which was the, uh, installed there, it's a radial gate. And we see here is some water splash coming in. It's, uh, the ceiling is not perfect, but you can also, you cannot see here is after repair, that the main arm of, it is difficult to take a picture there in this, uh, because it is in a tunnel, uh, to take a, a photo there. But you can see here, this arm, this is a reinforced, uh, sorry, this is a steel uh, I-beam. And uh, we have here a straight element. And you can see here, because it is difficult to see, that actually this arm buckled. It gave a elastoplastic buckling with a deformation like that. And uh, I think it is the, probably the first reported case where due to large hydrodynamic pressures acting on this radial gate, it causes an overstress in the arms. There are two arms and which cause buckling of this element, and it was exchanged later. This is already the new one. It was uh, the part which was cut here, is shown here, just to get an idea. And of course, if you have these inelastic deformations, it will probably no longer be possible to open this gate. And for the dam safety, it is essential that after a strong earthquake, you are able to control the water level in the reservoir, that means you uh, must be able to release water and you should be able to release water through this uh, intermediate spillway. Okay, this shows also this uh, uh, leakage at this uh, radial gate. Okay, uh, some of it, it was already not probably 100% watertight before the earthquake, but it was damaged uh, afterwards. There are some other gates here um, there with uh, some seal uh, leakage. This is from the, uh, uh, let me say, irrigation outlets. And we can see here seal leakage caused uh, with uh, water splashing. And this shows here some deficient seals through which uh, the water was splashing into the reservoir. This is not really a, a safety problem. I would say the seal damage, which can be accepted during strong earthquake, it is more a problem if you can no longer operate them. Now, further downstream of this dam, 
the other that it is a, a part of a big irrigation system. You have uh, irrigation canals, and you see it is a lined irrigation canal with some precast elements. And due to the deformations, this is about, I think, 20 kilometers downstream of the dam. Uh, you have here large deformations here along this um, uh, canal lining. Okay, we only looked uh, superficially into that because the main concern of our, our mission was the safety of the dam. But I still want to show here, this is a, a barrage uh, of this uh, irrigation system, and uh, which you also have in uh, Pakistan with many openings. As I said, this is about 20 kilometers downstream. Is a component of the irrigation system. So for uh, for lifting of these gates, you have counterweights. Okay, today you would have probably have some hydraulic system, but at that time you had counterweights, and all of course all of these openings you see is a large number. They have a, of course the whole system. Now this counterweights, they were not properly attached uh, to, uh, or were not designed for earthquakes, let me also say. So some of the counterweights actually fell down. You can see here. So the problem is if, uh, if you have such systems where all components are the same, otherwise dams are prototypes, you, you do not have, uh, uh, similar dams elsewhere. But here in these gates, uh, you have 20 different uh, openings with the same lifting system. And if the lifting system is vulnerable to seismic action, as you can see here, actually it could eliminate the whole diversion system, as you can see here. So it could, could cause a problem. So it is a problem, this is a problem for hydromechanical engineers who usually are not really too familiar with the uh, safety aspect, similar to the engineers who are involved in the safety of uh, the dam. Now, uh, as I tried to explain already at the beginning, at this uh, dam, there was no strong motion instrument or the strong motion instrument was under rehabilitation as was reported. So after the earthquake, there were no data available on the magnitude of the ground shaking or the intensity of the ground shaking. And the people referred them to a station about 50 kilometers away. But there was a stockpile of pipes here. And this is roughly right where this fall passes. And by this ground shaking, these piles, they moved in this direction, but they also moved in the other direction. So on the surface of this, I must say, unfortunately, I don't have the, the, this slide to show you. You could, you could see the path of these stockpiles in two directions. Unfortunately, I, didn't, uh, I could not take these uh, photos with me because we were requested or we were not allowed to take the photos out of the country which we have taken during our mission, but still we took some out. And but the ones which I mentioned, where you could see really see what kind of movement have occurred here, I was not a, able to take out. Now uh, there were some faults. This is a gentleman who was then in charge of the rehabilitation of the dam. And in his opinion, the active fault was here. And then also passing somehow, this idea was, was also passing through the dam or a fissure. But there were some faults near the access road. We could see here on the road, some cracks, which is a kind of a trace of one of the faults or secondary faults which developed. The main uh, hazard 
which I think which have been underestimated in uh, most places, I would say in most parts of the world, if I may call it like that, is the rockfall hazard. And you can see here, close to the dam, you have quite thick, you have thick plot. This is a trunk here. There were some people, some revolutionary guards who had a, a temporary stay here. They were killed in under, under such a block, for example. And just here below this block is this morning gl glory spillway. Of course, if they would come down, they would damage this intake. You see here, quite a big block. And here below is this intake of, which you can still hard see a little bit of this morning glory spillway. As, as I said, there are so many rock falls, so therefore the problem is that during strong earthquakes or after strong earthquake, it may not be possible to access actually the dam site. As we see here, which is just at the uh, right bank, you, you, you have, you have uh, rock falls everywhere. So at the beginning, people were flying in, flying in by a helicopter. Okay, there are some, this is a dam, there are some blocks falling down, this is also near the dam. So it, it was full of uh, rock falls, which is a kind of an underestimated hazard. And if there are vulnerable parts of, uh, of a dam, on the dam crest near the abutment, they could be damaged uh, uh, during strong earthquakes. Okay, you see some of the blocks were quite big. Uh, of course, these blocks, they are a problem for uh, then for the transmission lines. The transmission lines here, this is the first transmission line from the powerhouse. And it is clear, you see, this is maybe one, two cubic meters. It is enough if such a block hits this transmission tower and it overturns. And you have to assume during a strong earthquake, that the powerhouse is out of operation, like here, because if the transmission line is interrupted, the power plant is closed and you can no longer use the power intake to lower the reservoir. Of course, I would say to protect these transmission towers is a quite a simple, would have been very simple. It was not, it, it was not done in Switzerland. We have plenty of uh, transmission towers in the Alps and uh, which are mainly affected by avalanches. So you just build here a small triangular concrete wall uh, in front of this uh, transmission tower and you could have saved them all. Okay, this is just some more access roads a little downstream of the dam. As I said, it is, you, you basically have to walk some more uh, rock falls. Rock falls, uh, some people ask about vulnerability of tunnels or underground structures to uh, earthquakes. Of course, there are many uh, cases where some underground structures have been damaged. We did one some study, it is already a long time ago, 30 years ago or even longer, when, when in connection with nuclear power plants, People thought if you build underground nuclear power plants, you would be safe. So therefore we made a review of seismic damage to underground structures and we, we could find already 30 years, more than 100 cases. In the meantime, there are several hundred more. But what is the main hazard for underground structures? They are the entrance, the entrance portals. Okay, there are the portals of the tunnels. We can see here some rock slide and it damaged this uh, entrance part. So this is are the critical part. There are also some other critical parts where the fault would cross a tunnel or if you have already some deficiencies in the excavation of a tunnel. We see here there was a small oil pipeline, gasoline of the process from the Caspian Sea to, to this mountain. And you see this, uh, from some small rock slide, these uh, rocks have punctured this uh, small diameter, I think it is maybe only six inch, 
has pumped to this uh, oil pipeline, and you see here some oil coming out here. So uh, we we can have some problems with uh, pipelines, probably that has also not been well maintained, and it was already corroded. I could only take it from a car when we passed by. Okay, uh, then we have some damage in the powerhouse. This is a normal structural damage. Uh, we chose here the column and here the beam. And we know basically from, uh, let me say, sighting design of structures, actually, it is not a good design. Actually, the beam should be weaker than the column. So, therefore, the basic, the, the joints, or let me say, the plastic joint would develop in beams and not in columns. Okay, so we have this uh, kind. We have here in a control room. Uh, in a control room, the problem is uh, not really structures. It, it is a problem with the uh, interior. Okay, we have infill walls. You see, this is a typical case of damage. Infill walls, we have some on the ceilings, we have some light. And uh, the problem is if these items, are heavily damaged, as we see here, they can cause further damage to this control panel. As you can see here in the control, in the control room, and because of this damage, it may be difficult actually to operate some of the vital equipment which must be in operation after the earthquake. You can see also here there were still plenty of sand bags. This power plant was attacked by uh, the Iraqi Air Force a couple of times. They were uh, shooting missiles on the powerhouse. So therefore the control room was protected by these uh, sandbags. So these are some remnants from the Iraq-Iranian war in the 1980s. Now, uh, let me say a few words of uh, switchyard. What is the problem of switchyard? The switchyard, the main problem is uh, let me say number one, we have uh, heavy equipment with a high center of mass. In addition, switch yards in mountainous regions, they are on a flat area, and flat areas you don't really find in hills. So therefore, you have to do some excavation, and you have to do some filling. You have to do some fill. So, if you look into your earthquake codes in Pakistan or anywhere else in the world, we know for fill is the worst foundation condition. You have the worst, uh, let me say, uh, soil factor, which you have to take into account. And we can see here, this is on the fill part, portion where we also have some deformation of this fill material. So this contributed to the damage of these uh, electrical equipment. We see here again that this fill portion here, uh, which even caused uh, a partial sliding, but this is very vulnerable then to seismic action. The buildings actually at the dam side, I would say they were all destroyed as you can see here. There are some warehouses, office, buildings and so on. And when we were there, we were staying in some uh, uh, ship container. You see here with some transformers. Transformers, again, they are on rails and, and uh, they are also characterized by high mass and high center of gravity. Actually, these transformers, they should be uh, stabilized. They should be fixed, you know, by wedges, but they cannot move. Today we are doing that. Here we didn't have that, so it also derailed. And some others also derailed, even some sandbags. I think they were also from the war. They're still around. We have some others. You see these transformers, they are dislocated, and it is clear you have to assume that during strong earthquakes. Uh, a powerhouse will be shut down. Okay, some more. Okay, there are all these transformers were out of order. Not only the transmission line, not only the transmission line was out of order, of course, also the transformers 
and other equipment. There are some small buildings near the dam of the fell on this uh, car, old car. We see here again uh, the, uh, the dam site, uh, let's say buildings, and we can see here the villages close to uh, uh, close to the dam, which were basically destroyed. Okay, there's some pictures here of the damage to structures. It just shows what we know. The seismic design criteria for the dams are of, of, are much higher than those for buildings. I don't know what is the Pakistani earthquake code. Probably you follow the U.S. code and so on. But uh, for uh, for the seismic design of dams, we are, we look usually in events with a return period of 10,000 10, years. If you use Euro code or so, you only look into return periods of a ground motion of 475 years. So it is clear the dams are much safer than the, the buildings nearby if they at that time were even designed against earthquakes. Okay. So we see here is basically in this uh, the power plant uh, premises, these structures all collapsed. This is a bridge then uh, crossing this um, river and uh, some buildings close by. So the steel bridge is still here, but the steel bridges are also vulnerable to some movement. So therefore the support basically were there also damaged. Now, this dam, and I would like to show that briefly, were also then strengthened, rehabilitated, because uh, this is an important project for Iran. And you can see that two types of uh, rehabilitation or repair works were done. Number one, there was uh, epoxy grouting was done. Uh, we have seen a number of joints or cracks which developed where water was seeping through. So therefore, they were sealed by epoxy grouting. Okay, so it's, uh, to re-establish the water tightness was number two. And secondly, it was the structural improvement. And we have seen in the dam body, we had a number of cracks. So therefore, in each of the block, 12 rock anchors, were installed with, uh, with a capacity, total capacity of 10,000 count metric ton, 100 meganewtons per block. And we can see here is a, is a section how it is. The blocks, this is a section here, AA. We see here this 12, the arrangement of these uh, anchors. And in the top section, okay, we don't see it clear here, we, they are arranged, of course, closer as you can see here. So this is a kind of uh, strengthening which has been provided and by pre-stressing here at the location of the uh, cracks, you can add an additional vertical stress, but with, um, let me say, 100 meganewtons per block, the additional stress is relatively small because the area of the concrete is large. You do not have, uh, let me say, uh, a substantial value of uh, normal stress. Also, the, the, because of the big area of concrete, which you have to uh, uh, add additional vertical stresses. So we see here the ongoing work. So this is uh, drilling work for anchor. For these, anchor, for these rock anchors. These rock anchors, you see, yeah, for the anchor head, you have this excavation. And uh, these rock anchors were then installed as special devices. There were many rock anchors, there were 20 blocks times uh, 12 anchors per block. So it's, uh, it's about 250 anchors or more were installed at this uh, site. So this is uh, the dam crest here. This was done in, an, in a two years after the earthquake. And we can see 
here. This is uh, the time, uh, let me say, these anchors were installed and they were stressed. And uh, no, they were not yet, no, probably were not yet stressed, but uh, they were then cut after stressing, they were cut and these uh, balls were covered by a steel. But you can see here on the whole dam here, all these uh, rock anchors were installed at that time, uh, 30 years ago. The, the cost of this repair work was about 25 million US dollars. At that time, I was witnessing the US dollar had quite uh, twice the value it has uh, today compared to the Swiss price. So it's, uh, it is quite, uh, it was a quite uh, expensive uh, repair work. And we see here, as I want to mention, is uh, these cracks here at the lift elevations. We see here some grouting material with the epoxy grouting is seeping through. So that means they, uh, they wasted some. You can see here in the seals, here is still somehow some wet spot. Okay, people were there quite concerned, the Iranians uh, who were in charge yeah, because this uh, crowd coming out, because uh, the kilo of crowd also was extremely expensive, was probably $10 or something like that. So people didn't like to see this kind of, uh, uh, let me say, seeping out of this uh, epoxy, special epoxy grouting. Okay. Now, uh, let me come to the conclusion. I've shown a, a couple of uh, uh, photos here. Uh, let me say number one, I think which you should keep in mind, if you do large infrastructure projects, it is important that people, I must say, they systematically they are doing it wrong. It is like also in Fukushima, it's also not the case. You, the earthquake hazard, this nuclear power plant, uh, this was in 2011 in Japan. The earthquake hazard is a multi-hazard. It is not just ground shaking. Also, if you are mainly doing maybe uh, your society or your, the members of your society are mainly maybe more structural engineers, involved in buildings and bridges and so on. And for these structures, people look only into ground shaking. But it is important that for large dam projects, the earthquake hazard is a multi-hazard. And I have shown it in a slide at the beginning. And I would like to repeat it. It includes rockfall hazard, which has been underestimated almost everywhere or those who estimate the rockfall hazard. These are geologists. And the geologists, they are not familiar with the safety concepts which are used by dam engineers. Okay, so if you ask a geologist, what is a rockfall hazard? He says it is small, very small, exceptionally small, possible. Okay, they give this kind of quantitative, uh, uh, let me say, assessment. But this today is, 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 is not sufficient because it, uh, it doesn't mean much because the dam must basically be able to withstand the strongest ground shaking, which is possible at the dam site. So they may not know the geologists how large actually the strongest earthquakes are. So they come up with different concepts. Okay, so please keep in mind, of course, in Pakistan, at least where I have been, you have a lot of mountains and the mountains are even steeper and higher than in Switzerland, where we think we also have a lot of mountains. Okay, anyway, I have seen that. It was very interesting for me. Uh, the second point also this we Second hazard is that rock falls may, uh, uh, let me say, interrupt the access to dams. And uh, it is quite important if the dam is uh, 
uh, let me say damage you must basically be able to do a repair and you must be able to move in heavy construction equipment to the dam site there was a strong earthquake in 2008 when an earthquake in china and i must say uh, okay uh, as the chairman of this i called seismic committee we wanted we organized a, a reconnaissance an international reconnaissance team and we wanted to go there quickly after the earthquake but the chinese said it is not possible we have to wait 11 months actually until we could go there but when we have been there we have seen it was not possible to access this uh, this dam site one of the dams we have visited uh, an important one uh, the access road was blocked uh, was, was only re-established after it, it just shortly became before we came 10 months uh, after the earthquake before people had to hike there through this uh, landslide area and i think in in pakistan at least in kashmir when i've been i would say you will have you have plenty of uh, rock falls already during the monsoon reason uh, season so if uh, you would have an earthquake during monsoon it would be uh, a disaster along the streets like uh, like i mentioned here in china okay so please keep in mind earthquake hazard is a multi-hazard it is not just ground shaking as what people use in structural engineering for buildings and for bridges and some other uh, structures okay we should also keep in mind that earthquakes affect all components of storage dams at the same time at the same time and all of them must be able to withstand different levels of earthquake shaking there are some people uh, let me say goes to in tunneling they say earthquakes do not have to be considered it is uh, it is like that. It may not be that. It may not be the uh, governing load case, the earthquake load case to many underground structures, but it does not mean that you should not check it. Okay. So it is some uh, some problem there. And those who are doing the tunneling engineers, of course, they are mainly concerned about the excavation. So therefore, they're time horizon is only let me say 20 or 50 meters of excavation which can be done in a, in a few days or weeks but in the case of earthquakes we look into events with return periods of up to 10,000 years or even longer but during construction your horizon is only a few days to a few weeks so therefore if some people come looking at just are used to look in the short term, they think the earthquake action does not have to be uh, considered. But as I said, in connection with underground nuclear plants, which we have done, uh, we have seen that uh, to believe that these underground structures are not damaged is, uh, is not uh, correct. You still have to consider it. You cannot just exclude it. Okay, sorry. And number three, uh, cracks in concrete dams are discrete cracks developing along lift and construction joints and at locations with sudden changes in stiffness and or mass. These are kinks and corners, uh, which are locations of stress concentrations. It is uh, from a structural, from an elasticity. Okay, if you these structures do not in the whole range behave as uh, linear elastic structure but uh, just from uh, elasticity theory we know that these sharp corners give infinite stresses uh, in reality it is not infinite but it is higher so therefore these are the locations where damage occurs and the discrete cracks Okay, I, I like to say that this is the observation because in universities there are quite a few 
people publishing papers that I must say I'm also reviewing, I've been reviewing a lot of papers uh, from universities. People like to use the so-called smear track concept or damage model. But the damage models do not represent the observed behavior. The observed behavior is discrete cracks and not smeared cracks. But the smeared cracks model, if researchers are doing it, it can be relatively easily incorporated into finite element models, into continuum models, whereas the discrete crack is much more difficult. But the reality is discrete crack. Okay, next one, uh, I think I have shown it. It must be possible to lower the reservoir after a strong earthquake in order to increase the safety of the damage dam. It is clear. Uh, in Switzerland, we say if you have a V-shaped valley, if you lower the reservoir by 30%, okay, you can reduce the total water load by 50%. Okay. So if your water load is reduced by 50%, so for the water load, uh, let me say load combination, uh, your safety factor, if we talk about that, uh, would to be twice compared to full reservoir. So by lowering of a reservoir, you can increase the safety of the dam. I have seen in Thailand, okay, there are, uh, for example, villagers, probably in, in Pakistan, we have similar, uh, uh, similar observations. There are villagers which are already, who may be skeptical about the project. And if they see something a little unusual, they say the dam is unsafe. Okay. It's a very quickly, some people who are not familiar with that say that. And then if some politicians who are also not familiar with that take it up, so they say uh, the dam is unsafe. So, well, what are you doing if you have doubts about the safety of your project? The main thing is what you can do is to lower the reservoir. So therefore, for Pakistan, if you are I'm, I'm not familiar with all the dams, only with the very, very few, I would say in the future one, you have some uh, low level outlets where you can lower the reservoir is very useful in order to increase the safety of your dam. Okay, so please keep that in mind. Okay, and low level outlets could be, for example, irrigation outlets, as I've shown here. It can be flushing tunnels, you know, sediment flushing. Uh, they are also low level outlets, or there are maybe for water supply and so on. In Switzerland, we call them bottom outlets. And the bottom, I mentioned already, in, in Switzerland, every dam must have a bottom outlet, but this is due to, uh, let me say, uh, originally due to military re reasons from the Cold War. You would have to be, if there would be a threat, you would have to lower the reservoir to some uh, damage which is not non-critical for the people living uh, downstream. But today, okay, we do not think about this military threat too much, uh, So, but uh, the uh, bottom outlets have many other advantages. So we, we are strictly following these uh, low level outlet concepts. Okay, there are different opinions about that, but I think it is an essential part to improve the safety of your project. Number, uh, number five, hydromechanical and electromechanical equipment of spillway gates and low level outlets must be capable to withstand the, the ground shaking of a so-called safety evaluation earthquake, which is designed as the strongest ground shaking which could occur at a dam site. And uh, we have also seen, I must say, from the case of this safety uh, um, group project, that the hydrodynamic pressures on gates 
may actually damage gain. Up to now, up to now, it still many people feel the hydrodynamic pressures may not be critical. But there we have the case of this buckling of this radial gauge. Uh, why do hydromechanical and electromechanical equipment have to be capable to withstand the ground most of the safety? Evaluation earthquake. It is due to the safety of the dam because if you have a strong earthquake and you cannot, and I've shown strong earthquake, the powerhouse may be out, is for sure, is out of order. So you cannot release water through the powerhouse. Uh, so if your gates are closed and uh, they are deformed or your uh, motors are out of order, you cannot open it. Okay, if you cannot open it, then the water will still flow into the reservoir. So after hours, days, or weeks, your dam may eventually be overtopped. Okay, this is not, uh, I must say, for this dam here, it would not have been a bad concrete dam. This would not be a very big problem. Well, it's still a big problem, but it's not the uh, safety problem, let me say. But if you have an embankment dam, if like in Tarbela or, or, or in Mangla, or the big dam, uh, if you have overtopping of the grid, you know, and if you could not release the water elsewhere safely, it would overtop the crest and uh, eventually it could then erode, progressive erosion could destroy uh, the, uh, the dam. So therefore this equipment, if you have gated spillways, and I think in a big dam, you have gated spillways. So uh, if you cannot operate them, or no open low level outlets, it may endanger the safety of a dam days or weeks after the earthquake. Not just during the earthquake, that is uh, important. So therefore, these electromechanical and hydromechanical equipment must, it must be possible to open them after an earthquake so we can not have jamming due to inelastic deformations. Uh, okay, so this is a task of electrical, mechanical engineers. They are also not too familiar with the safety concepts which are used in the dam industry. So therefore they have their own standards, which I think I have seen myself, even US Army Corps of Engineers, they have manuals for hydromechanical engineers which do not satisfy really the safety criteria which we have. Therefore, in my opinion, they were, they are obsolete, you know. Also, they are US Army Corps of Engineers. You know, if the, if the different groups do not talk to the others, then you may come up with some design concept which uh, is, uh, does not comply with what we require. And the last point is, I mentioned it already a few times, the powerhouse is out of operation after strong earthquake. I've shown the view, we have damage to transmission power, we have damage to switch yard, we have damage to transformers, and it's not, 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 not necessarily the damage to the turbines. You know, it is the others so which interrupt. So therefore, the power outlet for where you take water for power generation is inactive. You cannot release water through the power intake. So basically, after strong earthquake, the only way to release water will be through spillways or low level outlets. So that is, uh, uh, let me say, the important uh, lesson uh, which we uh, can learn from that. Okay, now I have used my one and a half hours. So I think that is all I wanted to say. I just want to mention this is an important case study. I must say I have been there myself, these photos I have taken. Uh, and it is still, uh, I would say, the worst case up to now worldwide or for concrete dams. So therefore, I would say those who are working on, on dams, concrete dams, they should 
look into the lessons learned from this earthquake behavior of the dam. And uh, uh, yes, uh, I would also like to mention here that my PowerPoint presentation, I have given a PDF of my slides to Mr. Soaz Raza, and uh, you can get uh, these slides. Okay, so if you are interested, okay, he will inform you later. So for me, it is, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, it is, I'm, I'm quite thankful to Mr. Uh, Sohail Rasa actually to contact me again and to ask for, uh, uh, for this presentation because, as I said, I have been working in Pakistan for the Nilam Chilum, a very challenging project for uh, for many yeah well for many years for for about eight eight years and it was for me a great experience and it was also a great experience for me to meet the people who were involved in that project and I must say every time uh, we had actually a good time and I didn't expect it actually to be that good as it actually was. So I have very positive, uh, let me say, uh, impressions from um, from uh, Pakistan. Yes, and I understand that now Pakistan is, uh, uh, let me say, developing after, let me say, being inactive. Not only Pakistan, many other countries inactive for, let me say, 30 years or 40 years in the construction of large dams. But now Pakistan again is taking up the construction of large dams. And there are this project at the Indus River and I have some uh, tributaries at the Indus River. And I must say from my point of view, being uh, involved in large earthquakes, of course, for me, uh, Pakistan would be a very important uh, uh, country with respect to seismic hazards because of this uh, Korakorum uh, uh, region and Hindu Kush, okay, that region uh, you have uh, extremely high seismicity and that is also the region where you are planning your uh, large dams in, uh, in the future. Okay, so thank you very much. So if you have time for questions. Dr. Wele, on behalf of Pakistan Society of Civil Engineers, I would like to express my gratitude for delivering such <clears> an <throat> extensively informative lecture. The details you have given regarding the damage to this, uh, 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 this Rod uh, Dam was amazing. And I'm pretty sure the audience who listened to this lecture live must have learned uh, regarding dam design, how the, desi uh, how the desi uh, dam has to be designed and what preventive measures should be adopted. So I'm pretty sure we would be, now we start the 20 minute question answer session. I could see Suhail Kibria uh, raising his hand. So Suhail, you can unmute your mic and you can uh, ask your question, please. Uh, thank you very much, Tahir. I think I'm audible properly. Yes, you are. Yeah, okay. I would like to thank Dr. Martin on a very interesting and detailed discourse, a very interesting treatise of Safed Road Dam. Uh, I have a few small intriguing uh, queries or questions. Uh, first of all, I would say that uh, as engineers, it is commonly said that it is not the earthquakes which kill, but rather it is the poor engineering or poor design or something like that, which is responsible for the damage, etc. Uh, I would like to ask you that this particular uh, 
damn, you see, its case history is very, very popular in the literature, and particularly water power and dam construction have covered it, you see, uh, perhaps in their uh, 10 years back or so by uh, Hansen and Royam. I happen to read that through. Uh, what are your reasons for this kind of, uh, I mean, destruction? Is it attributable to design or to construction or to both? Uh, do you think that the PGA was, the peak ground acceleration was grossly underestimated? Why this was so for such an important dam? And what was the, I mean, disparity between the design stage PGA and the actual one which happened, which was my year? Kindly, Dr. Martin. Yes. <clears throat> okay, thank you for your comments. And the uh, question with respect to the design, I must say, let me say, when dams were first designed against earthquakes. That was uh, Hoover Dam in the 1930s in the USA. You know, a method was uh, established by Westergaard, which was called pseudostatic method. In a pseudostatic method, the earthquake hazard, that means the ground shaking, is represented by a seismic coefficient. And in the past, seismic coefficient for many projects, even in Iran, seismic coefficients were taken as 0.1. Now for safety route, originally people also used low hazard, then people made some reassessment a few years later, and they used uh, a seismic coefficient of 0.25. That is in the, because the Alborz mountain range is a seismically active region. So, the design, I must say, and the safety check for the dams was done at that time with the concept of uh, seismic coefficient and pseudostatic analysis method. In the meantime, we know pseudostatic analysis method and the representation of a seismic hazard of ground shaking by a seismic coefficient is outdated, is obsolete. If our committee we say <clears throat> the time is over for that. So uh, in Pakistan, I must say for large dams, you shall not use seismic coefficients. This is clear on an international basis. So uh, uh, the problem is if you are doing seismic, uh, uh, let me say, if your dam has been done with a pseudostatic method, actually, uh, if you do the pseudostatic method, you check basically the stresses, okay? The stresses are within allowable stresses. And I must say uh, from these uh, analysis, at that time it has been shown that the dam would be uh, would, would be safe because it's satisfied with pseudostatic uh, allowable stresses. But uh, the, the behavior of the dam has shown we have cracked. So therefore, Basically, the pseudostatic method doesn't work. Okay, because according to pseudostatic method, with a lot of stresses, you would have zero, you would have zero damage. So therefore, uh, I, I would just like to use this example. The pseudostatic method is outdated method. Today, you would have to take into account the dynamic characteristics of the of the dam. Okay, that means of this mass concrete. You have to include the interaction effect of the reservoir, interaction effect with the foundation, and to do that by a dynamic analysis. And also the size and hazard is a 0.25, as I said, pseudostatic, but in a nearby station, Abar, which I've shown at the beginning, about 50 kilometers away, the peak ground acceleration was about 0.6.7 G, maximum horizontal, so therefore, it is assumed that at the safety group dam, you had about 0.7 G. But I would just like to mention, there is no uh, relation between peak ground acceleration and seismic coefficient. This is, uh, this is pseudoscience, okay, we would say. Uh, but some people like to use, they say, uh, the seismic coefficient is maybe two-thirds 
of the peak ground acceleration. But this is a too much simplification. So therefore for large dams, actually we have to do a more realistic analysis and to do today a time history analysis. That means for your dam, and that is what we have been recommended in ICO for a long time, you dams and also dams we have in, in Switzerland and in other countries, we recommend that if you have substantial changes in design criteria, safety criteria, you have to make a reassessment of the safety of your dam. And you have today everybody talks about climate change, probably also in Pakistan, your flock, people talk about climate change, you know. So therefore, this is also. Uh, some change. So therefore there is a need for your dam if you have new information on the hazards to do periodically a re-evaluation of the hazards and to do a re-evaluation of the safety of the dams. I would say for earthquake hazards we may have to do a reassessment uh, maybe 20 or 30 years, every 30 years depending on what happens or if a strong earthquake Happens. But in your case, uh, I would say uh, if the dam has been designed with a pseudostatic method, which you were referring to, it would be time now to do a reassessment of the safety of your dam, because this method is considered for your case obsolete, if I may say directly. Okay, so that is, uh, if, if we look into that aspect, I must say in normal structural engineering, if you do uh, foundation engineering, you still have, uh, uh, what shall I say, earth pressure according to mononope. You know, this is a pseudostatic approach. But here we talk about dams. We have higher safety standards than for normal uh, building structures or bridges. Okay, this is a long explanation. Sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, I understand your consulted point of view. I still would like to ask that, uh, as you say, that the dam in, in, during its design uh, stage was uh, designed using pseudostatic method using seismic coefficient of 0 0.25. But had it been designed for a higher uh, seismic coefficient, as you say, on the basis of the nearby recorded uh, seismic coefficient of 0.7 during earthquake, then even if pseudostatic analysis would have been adopted using 0.7, would not have damage been averted? No, uh, let me say, sorry, for strong earthquakes, you know, we talk about earthquakes, the strongest ground shaking at the dam site, which uh, we represent, if you do a probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, we would consider a return period of, let me say, 10,000 years. Okay, if you do a deterministic analysis, we would look into the capability of the uh, strongest uh, uh, earthquake, which is possible at some seismic uh, fault, which may be stronger than 10,000 years on a probabilistic approach. Okay, so that, that is a little our, uh, uh, our approach. And we uh, require, let me say, for the safety criteria are for the strongest earthquake that the dam must be able to withstand the strongest earthquake. So therefore it can be damaged. So the damage which we, which I've shown here from safety group, would actually be, would comply to the allowable the damage we have today for the strongest earthquake. So from today's acceptance, with, uh, to today's assessment, this dam would be declared as safe. Also it is damaged because for the very rare event, 10,000 years, which may never occur during the lifespan of the dam, we would uh, accept this kind of damage because the reservoir could be retained during that earthquake. And that is the, that is the main requirement. It is the concept of allowable stresses 
allowable deformations, or sorry, allowable stresses, I would say for concrete dam is uh, is not applicable. We more have to look into is the dam safe to withstand the strongest earthquake? But if you have damage, if you have some small leakage, as you also have observed here, we would uh, fully accept that. Otherwise, you cannot design the dams, uh, let me say, uh, for, for earthquakes, uh, let me say, larger than uh, 0.3 or 0.4. You, you cannot have linear elastic behavior. That is, uh, is only in a nuclear people think that. You, you do all uh, linear elastic behavior, you know, but it is also not really true for a strong, but, uh, but for dams, we allow damage, you know. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Martin, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, what in your opinion is the main geotechnical parameter, main geotechnical factor, which led to this kind of damage in different parts of the dam in its pertinent structures. And did Iran revise their seismic code afterwards? Yeah. Okay, I have been involved in Iran since uh, my first trip to Iran was in 1990. And I have been working in Iran for almost 30 years on different projects. And I must say the Iranians in terms of seismic assets, I would say they were uh, advanced like in California. Oh. I, I would I say, see. you know, they used, uh, they, they did, <laughs> okay, I don't want to blame some people, you know, but I would just say in some parts of the world, in big countries, people use uh, uh, for areas of similar seismicity, much smaller values than in Iran. In Iran, I must say, I've not been in any project where the peak ground acceleration was basically less than 0.5 G. Now, since 1990, as I said, yes, since 1990. So we have been working on, uh, they really look into the proper peak uh, acceleration. And I have only seen recently in Pakistan, if the needle on kilom, you are used even much higher. It was also based on the lesson learned from the Mustafa about the earthquake. Yeah. So I would say, in the meantime, probably Pakistan has designed a dam with the uh, highest acceleration in the world, even. Yeah, maybe there is another one, but uh, in, in, in the US uh, somewhere, but they use some strange design. We, they also use the high values of maybe 2G. But I think in Pakistan, it has also changed now based on uh, the experience with the uh, 2005 Musafar Bada earthquake. People are okay, concerned. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I should give opportunity to others too, although I have many, many more queries, but yeah, okay. I give chance to others too. Thank you very much. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, so Sohail, uh, Sohail Gibriya, thank you very much. Uh, I will try to rotate the mic now. Sohail Raza has some uh, question. And then I think Rizwan, is, uh, Rizwan has also some questions. So if still the time, we have time, I'll come back to you. You can ask the questions again. Sohail Raza, please unmute your mic and ask the question. Okay. Thank you, Tahir, for giving me this opportunity. And on the cost of repetition, once again, I'll like to thank Dr. Wieland for giving such an informative and interesting lecture. And it was really an honor to listen about the dance from an expert of your stature. Uh, I have very simple one, two questions. One, at the beginning of your lecture, you said, but uh, concrete buttress dams are no more being built, they were uh, built up to 1950s or 60s only. 
is the large cost a reason for this or there have been safety issues in other concrete buttress dams also that inhibited people to build them now? Okay, thank you for this question. Uh, I would say uh, from the dams which have been damaged during strong earthquake, there's another one in China, uh, which was damaged uh, in the 60s, and also dam, Koina Dam in India, near Pune. Uh, it was a gravity dam of, uh, let me say, uh, unusual design. So we, since the dam in, in China, since the Jiang Dam was damaged, uh, people also think they have some weakness. Of course, they have some weakness in the cross canyon direction because you have a wets which are basically, you can say, your plates, which are subjected to transverse movements, which then can have their own dynamic uh, behavior. So the idea is, uh, I would say they, it seems they have some, uh, some weakness compared to others. I would say others are better. Now with the construction, I would say today, we would think it would need a lot of form work, you know, to do with buttresses and buttresses and so on. So it is, uh, it is a quite expensive. Today, I would say in concrete dams, people would go for RCC, that means roller compacted concrete dams. Okay, these are in, uh, I would say for large dams, people would do RCC dams. In Switzerland, okay, our dams are built. We would probably not build RCC dams, we think the conventional concrete, the quality is better. Okay, anyway, so uh, I would say today we would build RCC dams because of cost consideration and also with RCC, the construction progress is much faster. Okay, you can realize it much faster, but we have seen here in, uh, in some countries, uh, due to financial problems, we have also seen in Turkey that the state has given other priorities. So projects have been delayed by several years and probably in Pakistan for a big project costing billions of dollars, you, have, you may face similar uh, problems. So therefore the construction, uh, uh, let me say uh, time may not be that important for some project, but if there is a private developer who has just a concession of 30 years, for example, for him it is extremely uh, important that he can uh, complete the project as soon as possible. So it, uh, so therefore I say the time effect uh, has, uh, yeah, can be affected by different other reasons, financing, ownership, and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Just in the passing, a very, very small question again. You said the cost of repair work and remedial measures were around 25 million US dollars at that time. So that was only for the civil works or the replacement of electrical equipment also included in this, because they are also very costly. Okay, yeah. Maybe I cannot this. I, I always, oh, okay, I, I never asked me this question. Okay, so thanks. Should have also asked one. We were always of the opinion when we, when they said the repair, I thought it was for the dam. I, you, you, you are fully right that the switchyard and all these, uh, uh, let me say, transformers and, and so on, it must have been uh, more costly. I, I, in our opinion, it was basically, it was a civil, it was a dam work. The anchors and, and the uh, epoxy grouting. The other yeah, cost, okay. I, I'm not familiar, I must say. 
Thank you, sir. So, Tahir, you can give the mic to others. Thank you very much, Dr. Leland. Uh, Rizwan, do you have any question, please? You can unmute now and ask. Yes. Uh, uh, did the uh, fault underneath the dam known at the time of the design or later during uh, investigations uh, after the design and before the failure? Yes, uh, thank you for this question of okay, the fault. I must say, when we have been there, we thought, okay, we, I, I'm not seismologist or geophysicist, I should say. We, we thought the fault was a little away from the dam, uh, maybe uh, uh, about the kilometers downstream of the dam. But when this uh, person who was in charge of the rehabilitation, I've shown him on one slide, he told me then, this has been the fault, and he has detected some crack at the base of one of these uh, uh, buttresses, which when we were there, we have not seen. But he has seen then some crack. And uh, I have seen, uh, I have shown in a slide in this so-called foundation gallery, where water was splashing in, there was a fissure, because this was also a location, this already was there from the time of construction of the dam, because it was a geological interface between, I, I think, uh, basalt and, uh, and, and, and another volcanic uh, material. So therefore, this fissure developed there, but it, it didn't have any off offset, it just had a, it could be seen before, and during the earthquake, it moved slightly, maybe only a fraction of a millimeter, because it was at the base, so, but it was enough to, let me say, to wash out the material which blocked that crack, so therefore water was seeping into this uh, gallery. But uh, now, I uh, let, let me say a more detail, I, I don't think that, uh, really the fault went through or, or we have not seen traces there. I, I When we were there, we have not seen. It, it could have been that afterwards, some, uh, some movements have also taken place also. So I cannot really answer you well. Dr. Banfield, I uh, uh, referred to uh, the fault, the seismological fault. Um, yeah. uh, it was active. Uh, that is what basically led to such a high uh, ex ground acceleration. Uh, was it documented at the time of the design? Or it, it was not detected at the time of the design. It was not known at the time of the design. Yeah, people knew that the seismicity was high. Therefore, it did. The seismic coefficient of 0.25 because at that time I was involved in other very big dams in Iran, they used only 0.1, you know, so it was somehow no. But these documents, I must say, I'm also not, we, we have not looked, I have not looked at that. They're pure. Okay. So therefore, I cannot uh, answer in that way. But I have just given at the beginning uh, this map of the general layout, but the, the scale was quite rough. so. You could not say uh, uh, where it was exactly. It was mentioned. Let me say the premises of the power of the of the dam was just at the location of the fault, but there have been some. Uh, let me say secondary fault or secondary oh. fissures, so which may have affected uh, some part. <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tahir. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Rizwan, for asking such a nice question. And it was, again, a source of information uh, for everyone, the way you asked the question. Uh, so here, I have another two to three minutes if you can ask a short question. 
and I would request Dr. Wieland to answer it briefly. Thank you. Yes, okay. Oh, oh, thank you very much. You see, chance given to me again. Uh, Dr. Martin, uh, in my last query, I was also requesting you to please let us know that what were the main geotechnical reasons in addition to this inadequate fault study? Was some, I mean, vertical settlement ground subsidence had taken place, some move, movement or sliding of the buttress or the ground underneath had taken place. What is your assessment? Yes, sir. Uh... Okay, the, these sands are all on uh, on the sand rock. Okay, so so the dam is located on rock. There is no there, there is no soil. The, the soil is only in some appurtenant structures, as I mentioned already, in the uh, switchyard or for the buildings uh, on the grounds of the power plant. So therefore, geotechnical aspects. Uh, uh, were not uh, important. Let me say only rock mechanics. It was basically rock mechanics. It was not soil mechanics. If we talk about geotechnical. Okay. Uh, then there rock was rock mechanics. There, there okay. was no settlement, you know. I see. I see. So you would say that otherwise. The ground had no known problematic condition, no apparent problematic condition. Okay, this uh, we have not found. Otherwise, uh, uh, we would have had relative displacements of different uh, blocks of different buttresses, and these relative displacements have been, uh, uh, let me say, observed or let me, let me say, measured by the joint meters. Of course, the joint meters were not at the base of a dam, so therefore this information is not available. It's only available near the top of a dam, where, of course, due to the dynamic response of the dam, we have an amplification, and there were relative movements would be, would be more dominant. Okay. Uh, the cracks. There has been, uh, you see, a very variable nature and trend of cracks. Were they predominantly, uh, predominantly uh, in line with the lift lines and along the weak planes created during construction? Okay, lift planes. Okay, it is, a, it is, it is a dry, a dry uh, uh, zone, and I assume when they have finished the lift. Uh, uh, concrete lift and started with the new one, they may not have uh, cleaned it perfectly. You know, you have you still have some dust there, fine sand, and therefore, in general, these lift joints are weak surfaces. Okay. I'm really grateful. You have listened to me with a lot of patience. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dr. Whelan. Am I audible? Actually, one of my system has uh, shut down, so I have reverted to another system. So am I audible, Suhail? Yeah, yeah, very much. We can okay. hear you properly. Okay, I just changed my, my monitor. It, it, there was some shutdown there on the main one. Anyhow, Dr. Whelan, uh, thank you very much again for such an informative, extensive lecture in which you explain the damages caused to this dam in so much detail. And I would also like to thank uh, Suhail Rizwan uh, for their uh, very uh, inquisitive questions, and which was again, which added a little bit more knowledge to your lecture. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, as per our tradition, uh, for this lecture, you will receive the certificate from Pakistan Society of Civil Engineers and your shield. It will be sent to you by courier service by our coordinating officer, Ms. Sadia. And uh, I think it should be with you sometime uh, next week. And uh, the certificates for those who registered for uh, CP this CPD lecture would be ready for collection uh, on uh, uh, from 21st December 
and uh, the address is the same 14A1 Block B Model Town Extension Lahore and the person to contact on telephone is Mr. Ahmed Akram. His telephone number is 0347-462-5111. I repeat the number again, 0347-462-5111. So the search space would be ready for collection from 21st December, which is Wednesday. And our next lecture would be on 14th January, 2023, that is next year. The topic is, why do piling projects go wrong? Some observations and solutions. And uh, for January, our guest speaker is Dr. Derek Egan. He is a practicing consultant based in United Kingdom. And uh, the time would be the same, that is 2 p.m. Pakistan time. Like Dr. Wieland, he has also agreed to deliver the lecture on, on our standard time, that is 2 p.m. And uh, so this is what we had today. So now I, time is up. I have to conclude this program. And uh, uh, not the least, I have to thank Sohail Raza for introducing Dr. Wieland to Pakistan Society of Civil Engineers. And Dr. Wieland, I trust uh, you will come back again on our platform sometime next year, and you will again uh, give us the honor for hosting this lecture for you. Next time, I think Suhail Raza can uh, coordinate with you. So uh, I really trust you will come back again on our platform for delivering a lecture on some other topic, uh, which will be, uh, of your choice. So thank you very much. And uh, I will see you on 14th January, 2023, 2 p.m. Thank you very much and God bless you all. Okay, thank you very much.